In this video, we're going to discuss graphing lines and linear equations. Just as a recap from our video on point and slope, remember that a line is a collection of points that are given to us as input and output, where x is our input, our independent variable, and y is our output, our dependent variable. In the last video, we showed generating a series of ordered pairs or addresses in the x and y plane for those points by plugging in values for x and getting out corresponding values for y. In this section, we're going to talk first about verifying whether or not an ordered pair falls on a line or whether or not an ordered pair is a solution of a linear equation. So here we have a linear equation, y equals 4x. Usually we have some more stuff on it, right? y equals 4x plus 7, or y equals 4x plus 2, or something like that. It looks a little bit more familiar, but it's like y equals 4x plus 0 right now, so we don't really need to put another value there. Still, the important things about this is we have an independent variable, and we have a dependent variable. We can plug in values for x. We get corresponding values of y out. So in this one, they wanted to know, is the point 7, negative 36 on the line? What we're going to do is identify that the 7 is our x value, the negative 36 is our y value. We're going to plug it in, see if we get a true statement. negative 36 is equal to negative 4 times 7. Is this true? No, it's not. Negative 36 on the left-hand side is not equal to negative 28. So our answer to this question is no. The point 7, negative 36 does not fall on this line. Is zero zero a solution? It appears so. I would get zero on the left hand side is equal to negative four times zero. And this in fact is true. Zero equals zero. So yes. Zero zero is a solution to this equation. And then lastly, is five negative twenty a solution? So the original is y equals negative 4x. I plug in 5 for x. I get negative 4 times 5. Is that equal to negative 20? Yes, it is. I get negative 20 is equal to negative 20. So we can verify by plugging in values of x and y whether or not these points fall on that line. In this case, they all, not all, I'm sorry. The first one did not, but the second two did. Now we want to talk more in detail about some characteristics of a line. First, let's start with giving ourselves a nice way of representing all lines. So we're going to use the form y is equal to mx plus b. This is referred to as slope-intercept form. Slope-intercept form is called that because it gives us two important characteristics of a line the only two really that we need in order to graph it. We've talked a great deal already about m. We know m is the slope or the rise over the run. But now we have this new guy over here, b. b plays the role of the y-intercept or where the graph crosses the y-axis. b can be a positive number. For example, if I have a line that goes like this, cross right here, notice that this is a positive y value up here, because here's my x. So I'm going up from the origin in order to graph this. This would be a case of a positive y-intercept. 
a case of a negative y-intercept would be something graphed down below the x-axis when it crosses this line, maybe like this. And here now b is negative. So it's important to know the difference between those. If we see a plus number on the end, then we know that, that initial point along the y-axis is above this x-line. If we see a minus some value trailing off of the end, then we have a situation like we have here where the point that crosses the y-axis is below the x. We talked about this last video, but just as a reminder, slope, remember, we read from left to right. And so if a line is increasing from left to right, it has a positive slope. And if a line is decreasing from left to right, it has a negative slope. So using that information, let's try a problem. The problem we have here gives us the equation of a line in slope-intercept form. It gave us y equals negative 3x plus 7. It wants us to identify the slope and the y-intercept, and then we're going to graph it. So again, the number attached to x plays the role of the slope. For graphing purposes, I always want to express slope as a fraction. So if it gives us a whole number right here, I'm going to give it a denominator of 1. When I write my answer in over here, I can simply just say negative 3. But when I go to graph, it's going to be really important that I express all slopes as fractions. Because remember, slope consists of two different movements. A movement in the y value, expressed on the top, and then a movement on the x value, expressed on the bottom. In other words, this slope right here is going to tell me to go down three units and then to the right one unit as I go from one point to the next. So our slope value is just negative three. I assume if you put negative three over one in here, it would take it. I'm just being curious. So I'm going to find out. Oh, that's rude. It's the correct answer, just not in the correct form. So don't express it as a fraction in my math lab. We want to just simplify it all the way. Any fraction divided by 1 is just itself. So we'll write it as negative 3. But again, keep it as a fraction when we want to graph. Got mad at me. Remember the y-intercept is a value that's hanging out on the outside. In this case, the y-intercept is just equal to 7. If we want to graph that point, remember that that's the ordered pair 0, 7. But my math lab really just wants the y value of that ordered pair, so it's really just looking at what is that number trailing on the end. Here, notice it said type in integer. It doesn't want an ordered pair. So some uh, software may ask you for the actual ordered pair, 0, 7. My math lab is just not as picky, and so it just wants the value 7. Now we want to graph it. So here's what I graph. Anytime I want to graph a line, the first thing that I do is I plot the y-intercept first. Plotting the y-intercept is critical because that gives us a starting point. So here I'm going to enlarge this graph. I'm going to grab this tool right here. Remember in this problem our y-intercept is 0, 7. So I start at the origin. I'm going to go along the y-axis up to 7. I'm going to graph myself a point right here. After I plot the y-intercept, then I want to apply the slope to make a second point. So in here, my slope, remember, is to go from this point that I already graphed down three units, one, two, three, and then right one. So as I go down three and right one, I make my second point. The graphing tool knows that once I have two points, I've created a line, so I'm done. 
on the graphing utility, all I do is hit save. When I'm graphing it by hand, I would connect these two points. And there's my line. Slope intercept form also allows us to quickly identify behaviors of a line just by looking at the slope and the y intercept. So remember the two pictures that we just mentioned before that slope can either increase or decrease. So if I have a slope that's going up like this, this is a positive slope. I could have a slope that's going down like this. This is a negative slope. But there's more to it than just that. I can look at the slope, and I can also look at where do you cross the y-axis. In the two pictures that I've drawn right here, both of these lines, even though they have different slopes, have both positive intercepts. In other words, this value would have a positive b, and this value would have a positive b, because they are above the x-axis on the line. I can draw two other pictures with B values that cross below the line. Here I've made two more lines. This one, as I read from left to right, has a positive slope, but it crosses below the x-axis, so this has a negative B value. Lastly, the one over here is decreasing as we read from left to right, so it has a negative slope. And it's also graphed below the x-axis, so it has a negative y-intercept as well. This is really important for a problem like 14. When they give you four pictures and they want you to identify which is which. So what you're looking at are those characteristics. Are you increasing as you go from left to right? Are you decreasing as you go from left to right? That's going to tell you whether you're looking at a positive x, increasing from left to right, or a negative x, decreasing from left to right. Then lastly, are you crossing the y-intercept at a negative value, like you are in b and in d? Or are you crossing the y-intercept at a positive value, like you are up here in A and up here in C. So taking the combination of those tools should allow you to match these up. By the way, I really like this problem in the 95 section of exam 3. So now we know a little bit more about the role of intercept and the role of slope, M and B. We can talk about how that's applicable in a word problem setting. In a word problem setting, linear equations, again, are going to give us information about the slope and about the y-intercept. Usually, we can consider the slope value as a variable cost, a cost that changes over time. Um, like, for example, let's say I'm going to sign up for a new membership and it costs a hundred dollars up front and then after that it costs me five dollars a month. The variable cost is the five dollars a month, something that I have to pay over and over again. It's going to be represented by the slope in these graphs. The intercept or the B value is what's known as the fixed cost. A cost that I have to pay up front that I don't pay multiple times so in the problem I just mentioned about joining a membership, maybe it's 100 bucks to join right off the top. That would be the B value. And then maybe it's 5 bucks a month thereafter. That would be the M value, or some equation like y equals 5x plus 100. 100, again, being the fixed cost, 5 being the variable cost. As x grows, then this overall value is increasing by 5 every time x increases by 1. 
So when x is 0, this is 100. When x equals 1, this would be 5 plus 100. When x is 10, this would be 50 plus 100. And so what's changing over time is an increase of 5 every time. But at the very beginning, we started out paying 100. This is really useful for problems like 20 and 21. I'm actually going to go through 20 in its entirety, leave 21 to you. It says a motorcycle can be purchased for $8,300 or leased for a down payment of $600 and $240 a month. So there's a lot of numbers in there, so we need to just parse some of this out. It says find a function that describes how the cost of the lease depends on time. Assuming the monthly payments are made, how long can the motorcycle be leased before the purchase price has been paid? Okay, so the purchase price is the $8,300. We're going to leave that aside. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the other information because they want us to build an equation about leasing the motorcycle, the cost of the lease. So there's two different payments that you have to consider when you lease the motorcycle. Right when you walk into the dealership, you got to pay $600 to take the motorcycle off the lot, and then thereafter, you have to pay $240 every month. So the fixed cost is going to be the $600 that you pay off the bat. And the variable cost is what you're paying every month. The variable cost in here is $240. Now normally we use y and x, but we don't always have to. You can see my math lab prefers to use the letter t in place of x because t is represented as time. So in these problems we like to use t as the x value. And then particularly instead of using the y value, they've used p for our price or amount paid in dollars. So we're going to have a p is equal to Remember, the variable cost goes attached first. It's the slope. 240t plus 600. This is our equation to find out how much we have to pay for the motorcycle. I can plug in different values of t. Remember, t represents month. So I can plug in like 5, for example, and it would tell me how much I have to pay after 5 months for this motorcycle. Then it says, how long can the motorcycle be leased before the purchase price has been paid? And so notice it says how long. We're looking for months. Months is represented by this t value or time. So this is what we're looking for. And what we need to do is we're going to take the purchase price. and We're going to plug it in for p right here so that we can solve for how many months it's going to take us before we pay this motorcycle off. So we get 8300 equal to 240t plus 600. And then we solve. Subtract 600 from both sides. This gives us 7700 is equal to 240t. And I didn't get a whole number, but it tells me in this problem to round down to the nearest integer. So if I round down, it looks like I'm going to be able to pay it off in 32 months. So the last thing we want to talk about is building an equation of a line if I only have two points out in space. So building the equation of a line. Remember, we start with the standard form or the slope-intercept form of a line. Slope intercept form of a line, y equals mx plus b. We're going to do problem 24. Problem 24 
gave us two points. Gave us negative 9, negative 9. And it gave us negative 7, negative 5. So to build the equation of a line, we have two steps. Our first step is going to be we need to calculate the slope. We need to find the slope of the line. And we've talked about how to find the slope of a line between two points before, but we're going to go over it one more time here in just a sec. Once we find that slope, we can place it in the role of m. Then we're going to choose one of these points as x and y to find our y-intercept. So we'll start with finding the slope. Remember the slope is represented by the m value. Here's my x1 and my y1. Here's my x2 and my y2. And so slope is going to be negative 5 minus negative 9 over negative 7 minus negative 9. That is negative 5 plus 9 over negative 7 plus 9, which is 4 over 2. We can simplify that even farther to just 2. So in this problem, our slope is 2. So right now, we know the equation of the line is going to be y equals, we plug in 2 for the slope, 2x plus something. What we're missing is this piece right here. We need to know what this b value is, and then we can write out what the equation of the line is. So that leads us to our second step, which is to plug in a point and solve for b. Remember that x and y pairs can be plugged into this equation at any time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back up to the original points that were given, and I'm going to choose one of these two. It doesn't matter whether I choose negative 9, negative 9, or I choose negative 7, negative 5. When I plug them in, I should get the same value out for B. I'll choose negative 7, negative 5, just because the values are different here. Remember, the Y value goes on the left, so this is going to be negative 5 is equal to 2 times negative 7 plus b. Again, our negative 5 and our negative 7 we chose from here. Then we simplify. We get negative 5 is equal to negative 14 plus b. Remember, my goal is to get b by itself. So I'm going to add this 14 to the other side. And when I do that, I get 9 is equal to b. So now I know what the y-intercept is. It's 9. That's the only piece I was missing in order to get my equation. So that 9 is going to go in place of b up here, and I can write out my final answer, y equals 2x plus 9. And that's my equation of the line. That's it for graphing lines and linear equations.